Sunday afternoon, October 23rd, in time for the Money Show on the Genesis Communication Network, brought to you in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds. And this is Terry Brown. And I'm here with John B. Chandler of Austin, Texas, and we're going to be with you for the next hour to talk about money, savings, investments, anything having to do with money. And, uh, John, what, what's on the docket today? We've got some interesting questions. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Harry, uh, hello, how are you this afternoon? I am just fine. Well, Ready you, to go. You sound good. Uh, well, let's get to it. We have, a, I think, what might prove to be a, a very, very interesting show this afternoon. Uh, most of the afternoon, we'll be taking up talking about silver and the investment prospects for silver. Uh, and a lot of people are interested in that. Yes, they are, and the interest is uh, increasing. But before we get to silver, I hate to do this to you, Harry, but I'm going to hit you with a tough one. First rattle out of the box, and this is a question from Michael. Uh, I know you'll have some difficulty dealing with this question, but it's like Sam Houston said, if you get up in the morning and you eat a bullfrog first thing, you'll know the worst thing you have to do all day is over with. <laughs> So if you, you'll handle this one, you'll know the hardest one for the day is over with. The but I've already had my bullfrog, but go ahead. <laughs> the question from Michael is, having seen you first in the 70s on TV, I became an adherent to your investment philosophy. I wondered if you still believe in a permanent portfolio consisting of 25% treasury bills, 25% treasury bonds, 25% gold, and 25% high-growth, no-load mutual funds. Can you handle that, Harry? I think I can. Somehow I can. Yes, of course, the answer is yes. I do believe in the permanent portfolio split four ways between stocks, bonds, gold, and cash. However, I have changed the composition of the stock market portion several years ago from trying to pick high-growth mutual funds and having to monitor those funds to just simply buying S&P 500 index funds. There are a number of mutual funds that uh, actually duplicate the S&P 500 index. And if you buy two or three of those funds and split your 25% that way, uh, you know that whenever the stock market goes up, you'll go up. And if the stock market goes down, you'll go down. You will be correlated directly to the stock market, and that's what we really want. And that's what we were trying to do in buying the other mutual funds. At the time that I first set up this four-way portfolio back in the mid-'80s, uh, they didn't have those S&P funds within reach of the average investor. But now there are about 150 of them, many of which are still out of reach, but there are a dozen or more that are well within reach, and they're with companies like Fidelity, Schwab, uh, Dreyfus, uh, all of these big major companies, Merrill Lynch, they all have these S&P 500 funds. And uh, all you need to do is to, to look it up on the Internet and you'll find two or three, and I, that's where I would put the stock market portion. Otherwise, yes, Michael, just hang on to what you're doing and uh, the best of everything to you. And thanks for sending the question in. All right, Harry, uh, one quick one uh, as, as a follow-up to that, and that is this uh, portfolio as well as the portfolio in the permanent portfolio family of funds, the permanent portfolio, was developed a number of years ago, <clears throat> and uh, we've already dealt with in one program about that it seems to be a simplistic pr portfolio, but it's certainly not. But I would like to point out uh, that I know that uh, down through the years, uh, that portfolio, the 25% portfolio and the mutual fund portfolio, has been revisited many, many times to see if there was any reason uh, that it should be changed. And uh, I would like you to comment on uh, your conclusions after looking at it uh, over and over again and trying to determine if it should be modified or changed in some way. Right, and, and there is no reason to. Uh, I, I can't find any reason to. When people say it's simplistic, they think, well, there must be some formula like 38% uh, this and 12% that or something like that. But if you start playing around with your computer, you know where you're going to wind up? You're going to wind up saying, hey, what I should have done over the last 20 years is to have 100% in this one investment 
because it did better than any of those other investments. But that tells you nothing about the future, and it gives you no protection against most of the things that might happen to us. And uh, we are not trying to figure out what would have done best in the past, but what is going to make sure that whatever happens, you are safe. And to do it in a way that is stable so that the growth is steady and is not a roller coaster ride. And lastly, that it is simple enough that you don't have to pay attention to it and you don't have to, to suddenly throw up your hands and say, this is getting too complicated, I can't keep track of it all, and so on. And that's exactly what the portfolio does, whether you invest in the mutual fund or just simply set up the, the four-way split yourself. Well, I think a really good answer to that is very simple, and that is the portfolio has done what it's supposed to do. It's been a very, very strong uh, protection in times when the market crashed. It's provided nice profit profit when markets were going sideways and nice profit when something in the portfolio was going up. In other words, the long and short of it is the portfolio has worked, and it's worked exactly according to how it was expected. And there's simply no reason to change it. To change it would make the portfolio risky. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Great. Well, we have the uh, uh, question from Michael out of the way. And now let's uh, get on to the uh, silver medal. Silver. And Harry, I uh, we've discussed this a little bit, and I bring it up because as I read through investment newsletters and on the internet, I'm noticing that silver uh, is starting to get more and more attention from investment advisors who are suggesting that it may be a very, very good speculative investment at this time. Uh, and in in general, there are two arguments that are being advanced about the uh, prospects of silver and why it might be a good investment at this time. So first, I'd like to go over the two basic arguments that have uh, been applied to the silver question today, uh, and we'll answer those. Before we, but before we answer those, I'd like to do something else. But first, let's talk about the two uh, general arguments. First argument is is that some people are saying, uh, according to the data, that uh, the historical ratios of silver to other things like oil, food, gold, and almost everything else, according to those ratios, silver is at historical lows. And they say oh. that when an investment is at historical lows compared to everything else, that usually means that it's primed to go up. Now, later... I think uh, be a good point to uh, time to talk out about talk about why the silver gold ratio doesn't mean much, uh, but right. uh, we need right. to, we need to uh, uh, keep in mind that it's uh, it lows compared to everything else. Right. Okay. And the other argument we got a few seconds left. Another common argument in favor of silver is that most of the gold that has ever been mined is still around, stacked up somewhere or in jewelry. But silver is being used up faster than it's being produced. In other words, the available above-ground supply is being used faster than it can be replaced. And so the price has to go up to reflect that. Absolutely. Okay, we will deal with those during the course of this program. Right now we're going to take our first break. And uh, we got a lot to talk about with regard to silver, and I think you're going to find it very interesting. So please, don't go away. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. We'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. 
Go to LibertyFree.com to see a sample chapter of Fail Safe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's LibertyFree.com. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. And, John, I understand we have a phone call, which we probably should take before we get into silver. Uh, who's the call from, John? Oh, from Gordon in Pennsylvania. All right. Hello, Gordon. Hi, Harry. Uh, just a question. I have most of my life savings in the permanent portfolio family of funds. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason I'm calling is one of the prospectuses, which I usually don't read, actually, but <laughs> like my eyes sort of glaze over uh, of course. <laughs> but uh, anyway, under legal matters, they mentioned that Terry Coxon and Alan Sergi apparently were in, uh, being accused of being in violation of several federal securities laws um, and uh, are in some legal trouble. Uh, I just, I'm not sure about this. Uh, no, I know certainly that just because you're in violation of the federal laws of any kind doesn't mean you're dishonest or <laughs> untrustworthy or anything of that sort. But uh, I wonder how serious the problem is, or can you tell me? Well, uh, first of all, just to put it in perspective, I was once in violation of federal securities laws, not federal securities laws, the state of New Jersey securities laws, and that was because I lived in Switzerland, and they sent me my renewal form by regular mail, and it arrived about two weeks after uh, the renewal date, and I sent it back, and they... uh, then put me in violation of uh, the New Jersey securities laws, and on every application that I made anywhere from there on for the next year or two, uh, on the question, have you ever been, um, what is it, I don't know, uh, have you ever uh, had to serve a sentence, in other words, and the sentence I served was that I wasn't registered in the state of New Jersey for a few weeks, and I, anyway, I had to put that on every application thereafter. Now, the, the deal with Terry and, and Alan is much more serious than that, but I, I do want you to know that the securities laws are written that the slightest little thing, and you, are, you can be accused of fraud because that's the only thing that the SEC is really uh, authorized to deal with is fraud, and so everything that happens has to be fraud of one kind or another. Now, what, what they did was, that they uh, 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 assigned certain monies to advertising, and the SEC said that they shouldn't have done that, and they stopped doing it. Uh, but the SEC went ahead and prosecuted the case and actually took them to court. I wound up going there as a witness myself. And um, so eventually, uh, Terry and Allen just dropped out of the fund in order to, to not be smirched the fund, and Mike DeGino who had worked with them for many years and was very familiar with the operation of the fund and is a very, very competent manager in his own right, uh, took over the operation of the fund. And I really don't remember when that was, but it's got to be now eight or ten years ago. And the SEC thing is still hanging over the heads of of Terry and Allen. And uh, Mike, in the meantime, has done a wonderful job operating the fund. So, this absolutely, actually has absolutely nothing to do with a fund. It's a personal matter between the SEC and Terry Coxon, basically. Yes, sir. Not... So... Oh, excuse well, me. There's also, there's also one other thing in the prospectus. Apparently there was some dispute over a, a warrant uh, that was exercised inappropriately or something, uh, a lay, the layman uh, uh, well, now that I don't that, that I don't know anything about, but John might know something about that. Yes, I do. You, I, I I do know something about that. First of all, Alan Sergi has been dismissed from uh, the, the issues. He has a health problem, and uh, uh, he's been dismissed and no longer involved. Secondly, uh, Terry, this is a something that's been going on since I believe about 1992. It's been hanging. Wow. Over, it's been hanging over the head of Terry and the Fund uh, since then, and uh, in a case like the warrants, uh, our experts say they were legitimate warrants. The SEC experts say they were not legitimate warrants. Uh, Terry Coxon, his security attorneys and accountants uh, say they fit the definition of warrants. 
Uh, and uh, nothing that Terry ever did was done without doing so upon advice of counsel. One of the problems associated with this case is the counsel that uh, Terry was relying upon, uh, Securities Counsel, uh, died uh, in the middle of the case, and his records have been unavailable, so it's been going on for some time. Uh, the person or group that runs a mutual fund is the investment advisor. And World Money Managers was the investment advisor up until about June or May of last year, at which time another group headed up by Alan Surgery, uh, excuse me, headed up by Michael Pacino, uh, has become the investment advisor to the mutual fund. They're running the mutual fund, and Terry Coxon, uh, for uh, close to a year, now, a year and a half, has had absolutely nothing to do with the fund. There was never any question about uh, the integrity of the assets or the investment of the assets, anything of that nature. It was always a technical dispute over the definition of what is a, a proper and appropriate 12B1 expense, which, incidentally, the fund uh, hasn't had for over 10 years. So you can see uh, it has been dangling. Uh, it has been appealed. Uh, there have been certain settlements to reach, to reach and agreed to. Uh, it has only, as Harry said, to do with Terry Coxon and the SEC. It has nothing to do with the fund. Well, uh, excuse me, the, the, layman, the layman matter apparently was uh, filed on May the 10th this year, and it could indemnify the fund for almost $8 million, the, uh, the layman warrant. Uh I am not familiar with that. It was filed in May of this year. That's what it says, yes. Uh, so something said about inappropriate exercising the warrant or something of that kind. Now, that will be in dispute for many years because it clearly, according to my understanding and others I know, uh, was, in fact, a warrant. There's nothing else that could be but a warrant. And as a matter of fact, the fund profited handsomely from the warrant, to my understanding. The question wasn't whether or not it was a good move for the fund or not a good move for the fund, uh, because it was a profitable exchange for the for the fund. The only question was is whether it fit the the technical definition of a warrant. And there's one side that says it does, and one side says it doesn't. And I think that will be up in the air for many years. Okay, so you can you can then still give the fund a full confidence. Absolutely, and it's a it's, Terry Coxon is as straight as six o'clock. I'm sure he is, and uh, it is a it is a, uh, uh, a travesty that someone of the integrity and character of Terry Coxon would be brought uh, into an issue like this, particularly when he never made a move of any kind without consulting with his uh, uh, attorneys and his accountant. Uh, he was working diligently every single day to make sure he was in compliance with the security laws. But it just so happened these security laws that they put into play uh, weren't defined. Oh, I believe that. They were, they were <laughs> the not, government likes to do that. Yeah, they Bring were not ambiguous. defined, and they decided to define them on the basis of case law rather than on the cases of ruling. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're sure welcome. Uh, I'm John Chandler with Harry Brown. We're with you today on the Money Talk. And as soon as we come back from the break, we'll get into something a lot more fun. We're going to talk about silver and hear the silver story by Harry Brown. Stay tuned, please. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio. One that will protect you whatever the future brings. Prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression. And it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy-five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. 
That's libertyfree.com. Well, hello again. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. And we're going to be talking about silver for the last half hour of this show, and so we will not take any telephone questions uh, because we've got a lot to cover and probably won't even cover it all and have to finish it next week. But if you do have a question, please email me, question at harrybrown.org, question at harrybrown.org, and we'll take up the question next week. And, in fact, you can send us questions during the week and uh, a lot of people do, and we accumulate those questions, and some weeks we've done nothing but take questions that have come in during the week. All right, to understand the silver story, we have to go first to a land far, far away called Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., during the 1900s, the silver mining lobby was very strong. And they got through legislation that required the federal government to buy silver from anybody who brought it to the Treasury at a dollar twenty nine an ounce, which was the original peg price for silver at the time of the revolution. And so because a dollar twenty nine was way above the market price, uh silver mining flourished and everybody and his brother went out west to Colorado and other places in Nevada to to mine as much silver as possible and take it to the Treasury and get a dollar twenty nine an ounce for it. And the Treasury accumulated this enormous stockpile of silver, uh, millions and millions and millions of ounces. And then uh, the situation changed eventually uh, during the 1950s and the 1960s. Silver became very useful for photography and the new electronics. Uh, industry that uh, where electronics were were being put in all sorts of things in automobiles and in, in the now starting to flourish computer industry and these various places and silver was in great demand and so that great stockpile that the treasury had started to uh, diminish and the treasury had promised to buy or sell silver at a dollar twenty nine. Uh, to keep the price at a dollar twenty nine during the nineteen hundreds, it was necessary to buy the silver to keep the price up to a dollar twenty nine Now they were in a position where they had to try to hold the price at a dollar twenty nine and there were various intermediate steps that took place in the fifties and the sixties. But finally, in the early nineteen sixties, Lyndon Johnson, the president, proclaimed that he was taking silver out of almost all of the silver coins in order to preserve the silver. And that's when we got these copper nickel coins that have that kind of a bronzy look to them instead of the really pure silver coins, the, the dimes, quarters, and halves that we used to have. They kept the silver in some of the silver dollars, but even I think some of those silver dollars were copper nickel uh, that were made, but they had a Kennedy silver dollar, I believe, that was uh, abs- ac- actually real silver. And I, they may even be minting them now. I'm not really sure about that, but it's in very small quantity. Now, the point is that they were doing everything they could to try to keep silver up at a dollar twenty-nine. Finally, in 1967, they threw in the towel. And they said we can no longer sell to anybody who wants it at a dollar twenty-nine, but they continued to sell to legitimate industries, as they called it in, in America, uh, but not to speculators, people who were just investing in silver, people like you or me. And um, uh, with this, they uh, they hoped to stem the tide further, but eventually they stopped selling to the industries at a dollar twenty-nine, also, and the price took off. From there, uh, it jumped up to uh, originally about uh, four or five dollars, and uh, I think it even got to six dollars, and then fell back again to a dollar twenty-nine, and finally bottomed out in 1971 at a dollar twenty-nine, and moved upward from there. Now, what happened in the midst of all of this, of course, is that the consumption of silver was now outrunning the mining of silver. Uh, back in the 1900s, it had been just the opposite. But now the consumption of silver for electronics and photography 
and all of these different uses was now outrunning every year, and that's why the Treasury supply was being depleted. So because of that, there was no question that silver had to go up. It had to catch up for all those years of price control. Anytime you price control something and finally release the price controls, you know that the price is going to go up because it's got a lot of ground to make up. It's got to get back to whatever is its equilibrium level, and that's what silver had to do. But in the meantime, in the 1970s, we were also experiencing terrible inflation. Uh, the inflation rate eventually got in 1981 to 15%, and uh, during the 1970s, it was running 7 8 10%. And uh, so everything was going up, and that also was pushing the price of silver upward. And it also helped to make some people think that it was inflation that was running the price of silver up far more than the rate of inflation, because that's what it was doing with gold. Gold, which had been price controlled for so many years at $35 an ounce, even though the Treasury wasn't really buying or selling any at that price, uh, was eventually released in the late 1980s also, and gold was shooting upward. The first time it went up to $200 um, in the uh, early 1970s and then fell back to about 125 and then moved upward from there and eventually reached $800 at the end of the decade. And silver was doing something similar. Now, here we encounter then the first fallacy, and that is the belief that Gold and silver were moving together because they are two parts of the same thing, that they are both precious metals, and therefore, in a situation like inflation, uh, gold and silver both profit from it, and that if we have inflation again, silver is going to profit. Well, of course, if we have inflation, virtually everything goes up in price, but it goes up in price generally with the rate of inflation. The question is, should silver outrun the rate of inflation the way gold does? Gold is a very powerful medium during an inflationary period, and that's why we want it in the permanent portfolios. It's strong enough, powerful enough, that it can pull the entire portfolio upward if, if you have inflation and stocks, bonds, and cash are not doing very well. Gold will overcome all that and give you a profit in the portfolio. But now back again to silver in the 1970s. Uh, silver went wild. Uh, all sorts of rumors went around. The Hunts were uh, the Hunt brothers, uh, the sons of the famous H.L. Hunt, who uh, founded Hunt Foods and made a fortune and left it to his uh, children, Bunker Hunt and Lamar Hunt. And there's one other Hunt whose name escapes me. But uh, supposedly they were trying to corner the market in silver. And I met Bunker Hunt once, and he told me that he thought silver was going to go to some phenomenal figure, and he wanted to get as much silver in his hands as he could. But whether he was really trying to corner the market uh, is another story entirely. But he, whatever it was, he did not succeed in that. And uh, when silver went to $50 in 1980, uh, some people looked at that and said, hey, maybe it's time to get out of here. Uh we don't know where it's going, but it's gone far enough. And we'll pick up the story when we come back from this break. Don't go away. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler, and we are just about up to 1980. Just a couple other points about 1980. Uh, number one was the Hunts lost a lot of money when the price of silver then fell from $50 all the way back down to $5 temporarily, and the Hunts had not sold any of the silver that they'd accumulated, and they sued the uh, Chicago Board of Trade or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, I'm not sure which, uh, accusing them of price fixing, and that helped to muddy the story because a lot of people picked up on them who, who did lose money when the price fell and thought that that was the reason for it. Uh, I don't have to believe it was, but uh, that's just a sidebar to the story. Uh, when it reached $50, I wrote an article in my newsletter, Farewell to Silver, and it wasn't that I knew the price was going to go down. For all I knew, it was going to go to 100 from there, but we had been in since $5 in many cases, and in some cases, uh, all the way from $1.29, and so 
uh, it just seemed foolhardy to hope for another doubling when we had already seen a ten times over uh, profit on our money. So I got out not knowing that the price was going to drop, but a lot of investment advisors stayed in now saying that it was a 50 and it was going to go to 100 or to 200 and all of these fantastic figures. Oh, now, that's the, sto- that's the story up to, to 1980. John, have I missed anything? No, not really. Uh, there are a couple of points I would like to make. Not only did you write that article, uh, but we sent out mailgrams to subscribers and clients of your newsletter advising them that the risk-reward ratio was now 50-50, that the odds of silver going up any further uh, is no better than it going down, and now is the time to put in a stop loss such that if silver falls to a certain level, I believe it's $42 an ounce if I recall correctly, uh, then they should uh, get, out of the, uh, get out of the market. And because of that, uh, a vast majority of your followers, subscribers, and clients uh, were out, uh, but we sent the mailgram out prior to your article, I believe, as it was Farewell to Silver article. The mailgram was simply stating that what we hoped would happen has happened. Uh, the, the risk is greater or as great as the reward, so now is the time to put a stop loss in and stick to it. And because of that, there were tremendous numbers of people that made a tremendous amount of money because they've been following your recommendation. Uh, since actually the late 60s, the newsletter started in 1974. Uh, and uh, so it was more than just an aside. And as far as I know, there are a number of people who take credit for uh, suggesting that their uh, subscribers or uh, clients get out of silver. Uh, but I followed uh, 40 or 50 different investment newsletters at the time, and I don't know of a single other investment advisor that was specific and said, now is the time. Yet a lot of people took credit for it. And I just wanted to uh, compliment you on that in case people have forgotten the story. And also, I'd like to add that well, I thank you for the compliment. I'd also like to add that I believe that it was your involvement with silver and the possibilities of silver going up after it being price control that led to your in-depth uh, study and research on price uh, controls, uh, government involvement in uh, business and so forth that led to your first book, How you can profit from the coming devaluation. Wasn't silver a prime ingredient in you developing uh, the, the philosophy that was exhibited in the in your first book, Harry? Right. It was it was the gold and silver both at the time. Which I have to say that at that time I thought of them as twins. Also, I don't today just to give you a tip off on where we're going with this, but at that time I considered them uh, twin brothers. And, uh, yes, it was at the heart of that book, How You Can Profit from the Coming Devaluation. And uh, it changed my life, of course. Now I was no longer uh, a small-time investment advisor. I was an author. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was an author who writes books. And uh, uh, it was a great pickup line for girls. I was single at the time. <laughs> Well, I remember not long after uh, the uh, 1980 newsletter and the uh, and the uh, mailgram. Uh, it wasn't long after that you were on the Lou Rukeyser show, and Lou Rukeyser, if I recall this correctly, because I believe I was with you in the studio in New York, uh, but I may have it wrong. Lou Rukeyser uh, gave you great credit for, I think he even said you made more money for more people, anybody in the past decade that uh, went on and on and on. And he leaned forward, lowered his voice an octave, and asked, Harry, how did you do that? And I'll never, ever forget your answer. Your answer was, I was lucky. I- <laughs> Uh, and I was wondering, was, the last, was that the last time you were on the Rue Kaiser show? <laughs> no, no. But, uh, I don't think that was the answer he was looking for, but uh, I think that made tremendous number of points. The I was lucky comment uh, gained you great respect among uh, rational uh, thinking people who studied it, uh, but it wasn't the type of answer that Luke Rue Kaiser was uh, looking for. I'm sorry to interrupt with that aside, but... Uh, 
I just could <laughs> That's re- all right. I just could not resist. So let's pick it up now uh, in 1980 when you sent out the newsletter and mailgrams and. Yeah. That's kind of thank you, thank you, John, for having a better memory than I do. We're going to take a break right now, but when we come back, uh, we'll give you a forewarning of what we'll be covering next week as we move forward from 1980, because that's when we get into the really meaty stuff about what we should be doing today. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. We'll be right back. <laughs> This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. Go to libertyfree.com to see a sample chapter of Failsafe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's libertyfree.com. All right, this is the final segment, so let me give you a little taste of what we're going to uh, get into next week on silver uh, because as I said before the break this is where we get into the meaty stuff of what we should be doing about silver now during the 1970s a big part of the story was that consumption was outrunning production and that therefore the price had to go up to bring uh, for, uh, consumption and production into harmony to stimulate production and to uh, moderate the, the consumption tolls now okay. that story is certain circulating again today, and we need to examine that very closely to see how valid that is. And another story that's circulating today is the one John mentioned at the beginning of the show about the gold-silver ratio seems to be out of whack, and it has to get back in harmony by silver going up and uh, assuming its rightful place with gold, not to mention with oil and, and many other things. We need to examine that also. Uh, we need to examine all the possibilities. And if you have any questions about silver, uh, send them in during the week to question at harrybrown.org. And if you've heard any other arguments in favor of silver going up, please let us know them because they may have escaped us. And John does very diligent research, and he will probably add one or two more arguments that are going on for silver. Now, I'm not, I, I'll let you know right now, I'm not saying silver can't go up. What I am going to tell you is that some of these arguments are not valid, and they do not mean that silver is poised right now for a big rise upward to something like 50 or $100 uh, or even $20 necessarily. We just have to look at it and look at it dispassionately and decide whether silver makes a speculative investment. I will tell you also that it is not a substitute for gold in the permanent portfolio. There is nothing. That is a substitute for gold. Uh, and we'll get into all of these things next week, and therefore I hope you will join us because I think you're going to find this very interesting. Silver is a fascinating subject. It, it certainly has fascinated me over the years, and I'm, I'm glad that we're going to dig into it. John, anything you want to add before we sign off? No, but I'm looking forward to, the, 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 to the discussion about the elasticity of supply and demand, uh, which mm-hmm. we've been hearing about since the late uh, 60s, I presume. But yeah. uh, uh, kind of a mind sticker in, to me is uh, silver being uh, at historical lows compared to everything, not just gold or silver, but the ratio Compared to everything, uh, silver seems to be at a historical low. And uh, that is aside from the point of the gold and silver ratio, which may mean that something we uh, take a little bit deeper look into uh, next week, along with okay. the supply demand and what happens uh, 
when so price of silver does go up, does silver come out of the woodworks again like it did last time? Harry, enjoy being with you today. Take us out, and I look forward to being with you next week. Adios. Yes, sir. And you folks, you do be pleased, but blah, 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 blah. be sure to come back. Y'all come back. You hear now? This is Harry Brown. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.